All right, we are officially recording. So today the the topic, the actual topic is streamlining processes, uh, things of that nature, how to streamline your business, talk a little bit about scaling your business or, or areas that you can look at for growth, uh, channels of growth, opportunities for growth. Uh, but also we want to take as much time as possible to answer your questions. I know so far we're kind of here. It, I, what the course released has it been seven weeks, eight weeks, something of that nature. So everyone's had a good amount of time to take in all the information and digest it. Uh, and so you're getting to the point now, I would imagine here eight weeks in to, to where you're, you're actually taking actionable steps and moving forward with some of this stuff. So you may have some really important questions and I would love to spend some time, individual time going, uh, talking to you guys or answering your questions and, and, a bunch of your questions and talking about your business specifically and seeing what kind of tips or what kind of pointers that we can give or draw for you. So that'll be a big part. So if anyone feels like asking a bunch of questions at a certain point, we'll be happy to answer them. Uh, as always, when you're answering questions like that for someone, it, it, it always ends up answering a lot of other people's questions as well. So we'll get off. We'll, we'll start off here by talking about uh, some of those streamlining processes and, and things and business scaling and things of that nature kind of the same stuff or same content that's covered in the back end of the course uh, and some of the later videos all right so the first thing that we really focused on whenever we were wanting to scale and there's always a point like you, re you reach this point where you realize that you have the capability to grow but you don't have the ability currently on hand to do it because you know you're doing you're doing all this work and there's just no time and that's where that's where scalability comes in. I think I raised the question in the uh, uh, the the wholesale community group about what is the difference in an entrepreneur and the difference in a uh, a self employed person. And uh, for a long time, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, I think we were. Well, I don't think I actually know. I, we were we were definitely self employed, and it's a hard trap to get out of because you get into the routine where your time is essentially the amount of money you can make and it's 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 tied to that directly so you know the hour, you know when we put in those 70 80 hour weeks our our paycheck essentially or our return from amazon even though you know we even though we were taking small paychecks our our business only grew based on the amount of time we were we were contributing to it and that's you know I, ra I, for what it's worth i think ra is very profitable I think OA is very profitable, um, but the the problem you get into is it's it doesn't proportionally scale the same way, and we realized that and and wanted to make that change because, like I said, I wanted to take personally I wanted to take a lot of my time back, but I wanted my time to be more business oriented rather than task oriented, and, and that that's what you get into early. You get into the uh, you know, like I said, you know, my, my time equals this many dollars per hour to my business. And even if you're not taking that paycheck, it's still, you know, your, your, your equity is still tied to your business. So to become, in my opinion, to become an entrepreneur, you have to learn how to scale your business. And, you know, that's, that's my personal view. It's not, may not be shared by everybody and that's okay. I'm not trying to offend anybody whatsoever. You know, uh, I think, I think one of the most important things is that people take the first leap and get off the ground and start and start progressing and, and, and creating an income stream. And that was really important for me and Eric. We Eric actually had his wisdom teeth pulled today, so he's he's out. But uh, anyway, that was that was really important for me and Eric. Um, we we were able to leave our jobs because of RA. We were able to leave our jobs because of the because of that interaction and, and our ability to generate capital so fast. So it's definitely not that it's not profitable. Like I said, it's, it's all about scaling. And, and you know, be, being the entrepreneur is about creating time. So whenever you start and you, you look at your business, the, whenever we, were, we, we had moved to wholesale and we were thinking these are, you know, the first line of thought was, what do we need to do to be able to hand, handle a higher volume of product? And a lot of that is, you know, it, I, I could easily process, say, a 400-unit order, but what does it look like if I have to process 4,000 units? 
or something like you know equally equally big. We were we were doing really big RA numbers, so you know, but we wanted to streamline our process because we we felt like with particularly with wholesale, the ability to get your products into Amazon mattered so much more. And it's, it's not it's not because I feel like the market fluctuates. I, I actually feel like it fluctuates less, but. That you, you want that return on your investment really quick so you can constantly reinvest and grow your inventory because you're sacrificing a bit of margin here and there. So that was the first thing we looked at was our just our processing capabilities. And then I keep looking over here just to see if there's questions, but I actually stop and I'll take questions towards the end. Dylan, Dylan does that really well. I'm really bad at it. But uh, so the first thing that we did was look at our processing capabilities and say, how can I improve this? And what, what do I need to do? So ideally, and, and this is going to, that's the point is I, I think this, I think scaling is a part of your, your company, your makeup, how you do things. But the first thing I can tell you, I can, you know, that's the perspective I can give you is what we did. And the first thing that we did is we looked at how we did it and broke it into as small steps as possible. Like if we were polybagging, we wanted to look at how many, or how, what was the fastest way we could polybag an item. We, you know, can we, can we save time by doing it, you know, how much does the size of the bag matter? How much does, how many times you roll it have to matter? We looked at every aspect of, of polybagging an item, every single aspect we could think of. And then, you know, the size for, for what it's worth, and, and definitely in our business, the size of the bag does matter. So that meant that we, bought a much wider selection of sizes than, than you traditionally would start with or might have on hand. And because we never wanted that to be a constraint, we never wanted our time to stop because we were making a bag fit or, you know, getting extra wraps on a bag or what, whatever it was. Our goal was simply to do it as fast as possible. And then once we felt like we did that really well, you know, what is our fastest method of labeling? What is our fastest method of putting things into a box? And we sat there and we calculated all these different scenarios out and we worked them out until we got them to where it was the fastest that we could do. So that's, that was our, that was our starting line for training an employee is I don't want them to have to go through and think, how do you do this faster? How do you do this faster? I want to show them the fastest manner possible that I, that I, that I'm aware of that way they're only learning my best method. So you know, that, that takes you to another, another key aspect of, of, uh, scaling is hiring employees. We'll get there. But uh, the next aspect is streamlining, like streamlining your purchase. Now, this was, we, we create, you know, this was the need for us for the pre-contact spreadsheet. Because when you're, I'm sure that, you know, the, guy, the people in this group are being super proactive. You contact a lot of people and, and you know, it's a volume game. Like I said, it, it's a volume game on both ends. You're not just doing, vol trying to do high volume sales you're also having to contact a higher volume of people, which in turn means you're going to get more responses. You need to be able to organize that. And that's, that's where we used our pre-contact spreadsheet was to be able to organize and say, oh, I've contacted all these people. I've never been contacted back by the, these. And it lets us establish another point of contact, say through phone as opposed to email or, or whatever we didn't try the time before. So that was really important for us. And that was the fastest manner possible for us at the time. I've actually, uh, uh, interest from ASD. One of the people in the group, uh, Suzanne, uh, had a had. She's she's using a program. I told her I, she, I told her I would talk to her this week and maybe talk so she could talk to Matt and show him how to use it. But it looked really interesting for organizing your emails. So hopefully Suzanne can watch this video, post it in the uh, post it in the group. The program she uses it looked really interesting, and it looked like you know it definitely looked like it would help streamline the process. And that's another thing is always be not just be looking at what works for you, be looking to improve it. And I, I, like I said, I saw that I, I immediately wanted to have Matt or have Matt or the, one of our other buyers, Roy, try it out and, and just be able to see if it works for them better in, in terms of organization. But so, so that was one of our aspects was, you know, how do we organize, uh, uh, placing orders, talking to people, things like that. Then the next thing we want to organize is invoices. So now we're, we, we ask for email invoices and somebody brought that up in the, uh, in, in the, for, in the group this week was, you know, some people don't send invoices. 
we request them after we place our order. We request, please send us, please send us an email invoice with each order. And this is just so we can sort them in our inbox and reference them if we need to. Like this week we had an item. For some reason, I don't know why our return rate is higher than average. Um, Amazon sent us the, the dreaded email of, hey guys, we've turned this listing off um, because your, your return rate's high. You can, but it is the one awesome email where you can reactivate it yourself. So if you ever get that or, or something like it, uh, respond to seller performance with an invoice. It, even though that it doesn't say, you know, it didn't say like, hey, you're suspected of counterfeiting or anything like that. But we want them to know that we buy from the manufacturer and that our product does 100% match that listing. And luckily that invoice was extremely detailed. I have no idea who would be calling right now. But just unplug it or something. Uh, anyway, so, uh, uh, you know, they, they were able to match that, that detail page for us. And I, I, you usually get the email back with, hey, we've noted this in your account. That is a good thing. That's what you want to hear. If you ever get accused of, of selling a counterfeit item and, or, or whatever, even if it's an item you don't intend on carrying again, make sure that you, you address the issue. You say it's one of your wholesale products that it goes bad or whatever, and it's nothing you're not going to reorder. And you're like, well, I wouldn't carry that again. Make sure to address that issue. Send them an invoice. Make sure they have it on file and it gets noted in your account. That's, uh, you know, you see the rash of sus suspensions. These are how you avoid those suspensions. Uh, and we are so protective of our account. Like we, we do try to do everything right because, you know, when, when you're, you're as deep, particularly as us, when you're as deep as this end is, we not only are, are providing for ourselves at this point, we have multiple employees and it's, uh, it's our lifeline. So. If there's anything wrong, we, we definitely address it really quickly. Um, so that, that, you know, that, that was all saying, I, I talked for a really long time and said a little bit. It was a, uh, make sure to have, an, you know, for us it was important that we had a way to organize our invoices. Um, then we had to do tracking shipments because, you know, like we ordered a product uh, three weeks ago and I asked Matt today, I was like, hey, I haven't seen this thing come in. And bear in mind, this is only like, this is actually super scary for me because at this point, I only know part of the things that he orders. I only know the things that he orders that he tells me about. I, like I'll review, I'll review them at the end of the month and see if, see if it, it, you know, the profit margins work for us and stuff like that and the ROIs. And, um, but at, beyond that, I don't, I don't micromanage him anymore. I don't tell him like, hey, I need you to do this right now. It's, he, he's got a really good work. He's got a really good workflow. And, uh, that was actually developed from us. It was based on, uh, he had no experience with, uh, with working, you know, with, with finding products, with contacting wholesalers. And uh, so whenever he started with us, I actually sat down and worked with him. Um, it was the one, there was the one month that our, it was our December, December sales actually went down by $3,000. And that was because I didn't try, I wasn't trying to place as many reorders. I was spending my time training training Matt because we hired him on December 1st. And then you saw a huge, we saw a huge increase in January. And that was because effectively we went from one, per, one person sourcing to two people sourcing. Because by, you know, within four weeks, he was fully up to speed, pretty confident. I was reviewing everything he did and, and his communications, but he was, it was, it was effectively having two of me, two of me doing it. So, you know, that, that's another thing is even on the how you contact a company, that's why, you know, we, we, we try to stick to our templates. We're developing some new templates, and uh, Dylan's, Dylan's in the testing process currently. We, we mentioned this on a spreecast, I think, with, uh, with Greg, that uh, we're, we're currently having all of our emails sent to um, a, a dummy email. Uh, just a dummy email. It's some, something tracker. And uh, Dylan reviews all the communications going outbound from our building to a supplier. And then he, go, he, gets, he gets to see the response back. Matt, Matt forwards him the response back. And then he gets to see the re-communication back out. So what that does is it streamlines our, not only our initial communication, but our secondary and follow-up. Now, I believe the follow-up email, personally, I, Dylan, Dylan probably has, knows more about this than I do at this point. But I believe the follow-up email is the most important email. I think that's where you get to sell yourself. Uh, the first email is, is an icebreaker, and you're just introducing, hey, I'm, 
you know, I'm uh, Sean. I know Sean's from California, and, you know, this is my company. And, and um, if it's long, I typically won't rate it all. Yeah, and, I mean, we try to keep it purposely. You know, from our, our short templates that we posted, we purposely keep it short. And that's because we want them to read it. We want them to understand that we're a human. And then, but our, our goal is to sell ourselves in that second email for the people who require it. So uh, that, that's part of our, you know, streamlining communication is, is really putting a focus on, uh, I, I tried to, whenever I walked Matt through it, day after day, all we did was leaf source for days and days and days. We didn't contact a single person. And this was because not only did I want to become better at it, I wanted to show him exactly what to do, exactly how to do it. Repetition, 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 repetition. And we had hundreds of companies to contact. And, and like I said, this is, this is why we had our, our little sales drop off there. But, um, but that, that was because we weren't contacting companies. We were, I don't care, you know, I'm, uh, somebody raised this in the, the uh, wholesale community group too, uh, that if you're an entrepreneur, you generally you don't care about, uh, you don't care so much about money. It doesn't guide you. We don't care about money. We, we care about our process. We care about how we, how we do things. And then we let that turn into, turn into profit. Um, so so our, my goal was to teach him how to do it super well. I was willing to lose sales there. Um, now, for what it's worth, our, our other account was booming in sales. So, you know, we get the side benefit of, of, of that right there. But the, the one that was solely dedicated to wholesale, was, it dropped a little bit of sales in December, but I thought that was a great trade-off to be able to teach him. And, and our, growth in, uh, our growth in January was outstanding, and then it's been month over month over month growth. I mean, I, I think last month we did three, almost $350,000, and that was, that was a great December for us from a year ago. Like, uh, you know, and, and this is, I just think it's unparalleled that we can do this right now, but it's because we care about the process. And I, you know, that was, that was what I stressed was I want to teach you how to do this. And th then you get into the, uh, I lost it. I lost whatever I was going at. But the most important thing is whenever you're, whenever you're deciding to scale, make sure that, make sure that you analyze each of your processes. Look at from top to bottom. This is what my company does before I, to, to find a product. This is what my company does when I, after I find said product. This is what my company does to initiate contact. This is what my company does after it places its orders. This is what my company does whenever the order arrives. This is what my company does to prep the items. This is what my company does to send the items out. Look at it in every single step and try to make it as simple as possible. Because I promise you, if you follow, you know, you just keep following it and keep plugging away. It's annoying whenever you get, you know, you get your, your rejection. Now, some of you guys have already found some, some pretty silly, awesome accounts and I could not be happier. That is amazing. Um, and some of you guys are still working through it, and that's that. that, that it, it, it takes you know, it takes the time it takes. That's it's, it's the process. But getting good at that process, you will be able to streamline your business however you want to. It's not you're not going to be you. You're going to get to choose what you do in quarter four. For example, right now we're looking at hiring an employee to go do RA in quarter four because I feel like I have the time to train them. Our our employees. Uh, our employees perform when we're not in the building. They have a, a, a level of expectation, a level of care, and they're trained. That's, that's, the, that's the important part. So that moves us into what I consider to be the most important aspect of scaling. Once you, once you truly understand your own business, you're able to teach it to others. And for us, that's, been, that, that's just been the most uh, uh, phenomenal experience. I mean, it, it literally... I, we couldn't do we couldn't do what we're what we're doing right now without these guys, but that's because we were able to translate what we wanted, what, what we expected, and the way we did it. So, the most important thing is stop. You know, get to the point where you can isolate your tasks. Then you got to have a certain level of cash flow to do that. I understand and that that's the part that makes this really tough because it, you know right now a lot of you are reliant on that RA money. And it's hard to just go away from it. So just try to build it, you know, try to build it coming in toward coming in towards the center and uh, and do what you can to build your business. 
your, your, your goal at this point has to be build enough accounts that you can, you can focus on your business. And at that point, you're able to, you're able to do quite a few things. Whenever you hire an employee, think of the tasks that not, not only, you know, at first, the, the first thing we wanted somebody for is processing because I feel like I can process, I, I feel like I, I process items quickly. Um, but it's not the best use of my time. I'm not focusing on growing my business. I'm not focusing on getting better suppliers. I'm not focusing on finding better products. Instead, I'm sitting here packing a box. Um, you know, what, as, you're, as you're going to find out in your business, you can pay somebody $10 an hour to pack a box. They may not do it as good as you, but that frees up infinite more time, infinitely more time that you can truly focus on your business, finding a better contact, finding better suppliers and, and, and better products, negotiating better terms. And then beyond that, you can look, it's not just about, it's not just about the sourcing because I feel like we're at a, we're, we're at a level past that now where we're, we, we obviously source much better than we, than we ever have. And that, that's because our, our, our training is, is, is pretty precise but it lets us focus on what's next for our business, you know, beyond, beyond just the sourcing, like the, you know, you, that's where you get into, you want a multiple streams of income. You want to, you know, what, whatever you want to do, you just focus on what works for your business. So that was, that, that's really important is being able to hire someone and being able to, uh, to, to train them properly. Uh, Bob has a good question here that uh, kind of ties right into what you're saying, hiring someone. So Bob says that uh, I'm a one-man show right now. I really need someone to help me with processing and packing so I can free myself up to do sourcing, which is a great reason to hire someone. Like, let's point that out. But that is the type of things that you need to be identifying. I'm, it's spending too much time processing. I need to be spending more time sourcing because sourcing is what's going to grow my business. He's identified, Bob's identified that he needs someone to help there so he can grow his business sourcing which is great, but he doesn't know, he, he asks, I don't know where to look for help, and, and he says Craigslist. I think Craigslist is a decent place to post job listings, I would, but you want to post it in multiple spots. So the, uh, there's help wanted sites, like we used to, help wanted is like a big company, and they have help wanted city. It's like help wanted Lexington.com, help wanted uh, Louisville.com, help wanted Kansas City. I mean, there's a lot of those. So you can look into the help wanted sites. That's actually how we found, is that the, that's how we found our processing employee. He ended up being fantastic. Now, a uh, little bit of warning here. They, Eric and Dan went through two processing employees that they had to fire. Uh, and you shouldn't be afraid to, to basically hire, you know, to, to uh, have a bad experience with an employee or have someone that you're going to fire. So, sometimes you just need to do that. You need to hire someone, and if they don't work out, you need to let them go. Don't be one of these people that just lets a bad employee drain you. Uh, or, or be toxic for you. So if you, if you end up with someone bad, move on from them. And, and then I think the traditional methods of hiring people still hold true. I think you can put in uh, trading posts and little random newspapers and, and things like that in your area as well to try, try to find employees outside of hiring people that you know or, or, or family members. You followed up here, like, what do you think about family or friends? I'm worried about them being bad and have, having to fire them. The, uh, okay, so before before you start hiring and and like I said have a clear-cut job that you want them to do it sounds like Bob wants them to process make sure that you look at your processes how you do things and uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not going to not answer your question I'm, I'll, I'll get to it um, but look at your processes make sure they're they're as streamlined as you can get them so it'll help you so much being able to teach it from that perspective like don't don't leave especially early don't leave a lot of uh, a lot of open-endedness with our first employee, that was the problem, uh, and you know it became a it became a question of, of complacency where he was kind of performing to the task that that you know we we pay process this stuff and all right I'll do it and and that just doesn't work for for our company like uh, really whenever we started thinking about the the most important aspects of hiring is define what your company is about. Go, go look at, look at the, you know, what, what is, what is the idea that your company is about? What, what, is your, what does your company want to promote? 
You know, what makes you happy? What makes you feel successful? Um, for for our, uh, one of our key things is dedication. We want people to be dedicated to, to their job. We want people who want to work. Like that's, you know, I'm dedicated. I'm here all, I'm here. If I don't feel good, I'm here. And, and that's because I care about my business and I want to, I, I want to perform and I want it to perform for me. So to sit down, define the key attributes that you want to see in a human being and, and, and use that to kind of guide your, guide your decision with hiring people. Um, and then uh, this was our first, our first, uh, first employee was kind of a friend. Uh, I, I would suggest not hiring, not hiring a friend, uh, not hiring family, not hiring friends. It is, it is very hard to fire that person, but when it's the right time, you need to be able to do it. And you don't want to, you don't want to get in a position where you can't, you don't feel like you can do it because, because they're your friend and you know, they rely on you uh, or what have you. So I would advise against hiring family and friends. I know it's always the most convenient. It's not, but it doesn't, it, I'm telling you, it, it, in the instance that it, it works until it doesn't, and when it doesn't, it's miserable. Um, so, so I would advise against, I, I would look for a more traditional route. Now, like Dylan said, we used um, uh, Help Wanted. We used a couple of the other little, I mean, everybody has, has them in their area, the, the little website that, that about your local area. Craigslist is a great one. Our area is unfortunately not big enough to really have a Craigslist dedicated to us. It's a uh, Craigslist, e Craigslist, like Eastern, Eastern Kentucky, an entire region. So you know, the, the person I, that sees my ad may be three hundred miles away from me. Um, so if you're if your area, then uh, you know if, if your area is big enough for Craigslist, that's a fantastic one. But just look at that. You can look also uh, for us. Our, our local paper is not a terrible one. Our local uh, uh, radio, our local radio. There's just not a lot going on here. But uh, we found we found Barron through, and we actually had quite a few applications, significantly more than I expected to uh, to come through the the Help Wanted site. And uh, one of the key things that made Barron stand out was he he told us how much he wanted to work. He was a he was a former coal miner that had gotten laid off. So as a coal miner, uh, you know, in our, uh, that, that's not, that doesn't translate to a lot of other areas, but those guys are super hard workers. I mean, it's, it's a tough job. And dangerous. Dangerous. Um, so, so we, we, we feel really good about that. And, you know, he got laid off and, and he, he was wanting a job and he was like, we asked him, you know, how, how familiar are you with, with, uh, with e-commerce and things He's like, man, I have no idea. I've never done it. He's like, but I did apply to you guys from, from the internet. So I know how to use computer. Uh, but he was like, Hey, I'll come in. I'll learn every day. And I, you know, I want to learn. So, and, and that, and we felt really good about it. Develop a good list of interview questions and don't make them just focused on the job. Make them focused on the person because if the person's the right person, you're going, they're going to perform at their job. So, Focus, focus, focus from that regard. Look at, look at it as you're hiring a person, not a, not an employee to do a task because ultimately it's, they're, they're a part of your team. Yeah. And Connie has a good suggestion for, if you're looking for part-time help that the local colleges putting up flyers and things like that or advertising at local colleges, it's good to find uh, some young person for, for part-time help, and especially here seasonal for quarter four. So that's another op option as well. Uh, and, the stuff that Dan was talking about, I think it really it rings true that if you're going to hire an employee that you need to do a lot of planning and have clearly defined job duties and what they're going to do, you need to know what they're going to do uh, and, and have that planned out. And, because organizing an employee means that you, like it helps to get you organized. So if you're going to have someone coming in on Mondays and Wednesdays part-time to help you process, you've got to have things ready for them to process on those days so it organizes you to get work done and force you to do things in preparation for them coming because you don't want them to come and have nothing to do so it's also a great motivator for yourself because uh, it does put an onus on you to, to get certain things done or to organize them organize yourself originally whenever we were hiring our first employee we were thinking well we'll just have them come in when we want to but then that, that actually rings very true because I, I, I was talking to Eric and we, we both decided that that was, you know, that, that's not a way I would want to live my life as a human, uh, not, 
not knowing when I'm going to work. And it's ultimately not their fault if, uh, if we didn't provide them work to do. So that actually helped us, uh, help, helped us is we just hired them on 40, 40 hours a week. And that helped us provide them work to do. You know, that inspired us to make sure that things are coming, make sure that, you know, products are, uh, products are being delivered, have a clear cut thing for if there's not product in the building, what they should be doing. I'll be that listing. We used to list products on eBay. And if you still do that, more power to you. But uh, we, you know, we used to list our returns and stuff like that. But that was because we wanted something for our employees to do during hours that they didn't have products to process. Um, then, uh, yeah, so that, that's, that I think to, to be able to hire someone, I really feel like it, we, you know, that was our goal was to hire, hire someone under the, under the scenarios that we would want to work. Um, what was I don't want to miss some of the questions here. No, I, don't, I think that's mentioned. Uh, I don't think we missed any. Connie, I think that or Dylan mentioned earlier with the local colleges. I think that's a that's not only a a great idea for for the first level of just hiring help, seasonal help, or, or what have you, part time employees. Uh, for us, we were actually considering uh, uh, actually work starting to work with colleges to, to try to hire talent out of colleges, and that, I think that's a, that's a key part to growth for us. Yeah, Bob, Bob also mentioned that. Uh, one of his issues is the person would have to work out of his home that he's trying to help. And that, that does bring up a whole new batch of problems or issues that can be, we, we, I don't really know 100% how is to it, answer that. Uh, Working out of your home, you definitely want to be there to supervise them if it's even, I assume it's legal, right, for them to work in your home. I honestly don't know. I mean, I honestly don't know. I guess first find out the legalities of having someone work out of your home. Um, yeah, I, I, I've not encountered that. I, I apologize. I can't. I can't answer that one. It's just, it's just something we've never encountered. We, we, we. Unfortunately, you know, the, the disadvantages of uh, of Kentucky are that it's in the middle of nowhere. The advantages of Kentucky is that everything is super cheap. Yeah. So Labor. renting commercial space, you know, I, I can rent. I can rent commercial space for rates that you guys can't imagine because you're in a real city. Uh, but yeah, as, like Lauren said, I'm not sure that I would re recommend letting someone work out of my home. It's uh, and it's you know I, I inherently pr I think I trust people more than most people. But still, it's particularly I have, I have children and stuff. Like I probably wouldn't just just would never do it. Uh, but that gives you the opportunity to uh, beyond 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 that. You might you, what if you could set up something? Maybe if you have a garage or if you uh, just maybe get a get, get a small building I, I, I know you can get those pretty cheap uh just to just work out of in your in your yard or, or whatever but honestly i don't i don't have a i don't have a great answer for you bob um i agree time to expand uh -huh. and that's that's one of the things I, I think that's one of the honest honest to god things that has helped us is we've always uh you know work's always been work i'm not sure that i could have the same level of commitment you know whenever whenever i'm at home uh, I, just like anybody else, I want to watch TV. I want to watch TV. I want to play with my kids. I want to get in the pool. I want to do whatever it is. Um, and, and that's not because, you know, I'm a lazy guy. It's because I'm at home and that's what I do at home. I'm not sure that, you know, if, if for those of you working out of your house and, and really doing a, uh, a big, big time commitment to it, that's fantastic. I, I applaud you. I applaud you. I'm not sure that I could do it. I like to think I could, but. At the end of the day, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. I wouldn't just be like, "Oh, I'll come, I promise I'll do." You know, I'll leave source for another two hours after I get out of the pool. Like, just I'm not entirely sure I could, could. You know, I have the self discipline. So, but but whenever you do, whenever you do get a commercial space, and you're you know you're, it, it's not only the act of paying for the space. Uh, that was the most important thing. Whenever we decided to leave our jobs, was that we had some place to go work, and that's because you know whenever it's time to go to work time. We're at work. Whenever it's time to uh, time to go home, go home time, we were able to go home and separate work from work from home. But uh, so that's you know that's definitely to be honest with you, that's definitely a uh, uh, a huge part of scaling is 
is get you know even if you even if you don't want a warehouse that that's the, that's one of the things even if you don't want a warehouse you're utilizing fulfillment centers or something like that just getting a just getting a small office will will help, I, I think it, it would help you know help my productivity uh, to, to just have some place to, to call work and, and legitimately have it work yeah and while it's fleeting on my mind before I forget um, so we talked about how you always want things for your employees to do, especially if you're setting them up on schedule. So let's say that there are days where you don't really have a lot of stuff to process, or none, or they finish it all, and there's plenty of time left in the day. That's where you have to be and smart and find other things that this person can do that can help your business. So like if they, there's, they're running out of things to process, well, then you need to show them how to, to do OA sourcing or something like that. Find other aspects or ways that they can help you all the time, no matter what, and for that to be as efficient as possible, and not to interrupt your interrupt your workflow. That, that's that's the point of teaching them teaching them aggressively beforehand. Is, for example, whenever uh, whenever Baron has nothing to process, he will start doing OA. He will go check. He will go immediately start checking our. We we keep some small amount of inventory on hand. He, he will check to see if anything needs to go in or anything can be pre-processed. If nothing can be pre-processed, like Dylan says, he jumps in, he starts doing OA, and I don't even know that he's not, uh, that, that he's not processing stuff because, you know, he's, he's, on, he's on, on a different side of the building than I am. But I have no concerns that he's, he's, he's just sitting there. But he has, you know, that's, that's the thing is, you don't want them to come and say, hey boss, what do I need to do now because I finished that. And, and just to be thinking of, oh, okay, well, you could do this. You need to come up with a list of tasks, a, a list of, of, of projects, a list of something they can be working on, and when they get done, can immediately jump to that. You don't want them to come and have to ask every single time. And, and you know, I don't, that, I don't feel like that makes you a bad person because you're not communicating with them. I, I still, I go out every morning and communicate, and I communicate all day long with, with our guys. And then we sit down and have a, uh, a one-hour focus session uh, twice, twice or two to three times a week, depending on, on when we're in the office versus at shows or at conferences or whatever. But at least two times a week, we, we sit down and have a one-hour focus and, and talk about what's, what's going on, um, how we can improve, and just things to, things to look for. And one of, the, one of the most important things that came out of that was the, was the Restock Pro. And it, I'll be honest with you guys. That has been a it, that has been amazing. If it, it, you know, if anyone's doing a lot of wholesale right now, it has been absolutely phenomenal. A great product. Uh, yeah, Jimmy asked. Uh, so we may have mentioned it before, but how did they? How did you guys find me? So that's a pretty quick story. Uh, we all, Eric, Dan, and I all play a, a silly card game called Magic Gathering. We played it for very many years, and we knew each other from basically playing that game all around the southeast part of the United States. Uh, but they they come to know me. They knew that I was a web designer, and they needed a web design project one time. So they just hired me, contracted me out to do that for them, and then they hired me for another contract job. And then they just liked my work and hired me all the way. <laughs> yeah. Time. Dylan was Dylan was one of the tougher hires because the uh, friend you know he is he is a friend but uh, before before Dylan that that was one of the things is we didn't hire Dylan just because he didn't have a job uh, they hired me away from my job right we hired Dylan away from a actually pretty high paying job for our area and uh, and it, you know he was he was he actually organized a conference for us to speak at. A few months before we, a few months before we hired him, so you know we got to see Dylan kind of in his own element at his own job, and uh, you know, like I said, that was one of the that was whenever we were we really sat down and said, these are the things that embody the employee that we want, and Dylan matched up to them. Uh, Dylan has been Dylan's been a phenomenal employee, and that's because that's because that, that's because he matches what our company is about, and you know, Dylan's here. Late at night, if he needs to, he's he's up early in the morning if he needs to. He's always he's always available. He's always working, and that's 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 the dedication that, that we look for. And there's five there, there's five components that that we were uh, that we were hiring on. And dedication was the most important by far to me. 
So, uh, but but yeah, make sure that they uh, make sure that they that, you know somebody fits your company model, not just if you do hire a friend, you're not hiring somebody because they need a job. Hire somebody because you need their services. Except for getting all the time. Oh yeah, yeah. He was a uh, he, he was not supposed to be on the forklift, um, but he didn't drive it. So yeah, <laughs> good news. Good news is he didn't drive it, so so we didn't have to like beat him up or reprimand him or anything. But uh, yeah, I mean that's a essentially for us the the most important the most important aspect of scaling is, is people. And here's 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 another dynamic you get whenever you have great employees. And this is this this just pushes you farther and faster. It's it's like the the whole snowball concept. Uh, whenever you get uh, whenever you get employees and they're dedicated to your business and they care about your business and, and, and they're, you know, they're, they're there for more than just a paycheck. They start contributing ideas and those ideas, it, it, just imagine, you know, our, our one hour, our, our one hour meeting or focus meeting is, um, is a mastermind meeting. That's what, that's all it is that you, you know, I do believe in the power of masterminds wholeheartedly. Uh, we try to share and we try to, uh, to talk to people and, and, and get, get, receive and give information because I do, I do believe that, that the more, the more you, the more you give, the more you're going to receive in terms of, uh, in terms of growing your own business. So, but every day I come to work, it's like having a little mastermind. Yeah. That, every, literally every day when Dan comes in, he comes into my office because my office is attached to his and we basically just shoot. I like, Every night we go home and come up with some silly random idea or scheme, and then we come every day. We come into work, and we he has schemes and ideas that he tells me, and I tell him what I think about him and about those ideas. <laughs> well, and then I, I have ideas, and I tell him, and he tells me what he thinks about those ideas. And we, we learn a lot from those. Or sometimes, a lot of times, ideas are terrible, and sometimes they're very good. Uh, and it just takes one or two good ideas to to figure out. Uh, uh, but, how to make a lot of money. <laughs> that, that's, that's one of the things is, uh, uh, Dylan, what percentage of the time would you say my ideas are completely crazy? I, I can't set a number on it. Though. I, would it be a high or low percentage? Uh, well, I mean, I would say both of us, I, it's a high percentage of terrible ideas. <laughs> I, I qualify mine. I always tell you, like, I'm pretty sure this is a terrible idea, but you tell me because mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not sure. But we – We've grown a lot, or we, we've learned a lot. Uh, oh, it's a it, Jimmy. It's a very high percentage. I come in with some really crazy ideas. Uh, mostly, mostly my ideas currently. For example, I give you, a, I'll give you a good one. Uh, trading guns and knives is like really big in our area. Let's see, <laughs> this so, one's not a bad one though. This was this, this one. No, but this was this to give you. This was acceptable. Like when you. <laughs> When you conceptualize that this was an acceptable form of, of idea, that uh, you, you get to see that uh, you can imagine the unacceptable. So uh, guns and knives trading is really big in our area. One of our friends was telling us about, he runs like a, some kind of subscription service or something like that. And I thought about the, you know, I, well, if you're buying a gun uh, off one of these gun trader groups, Nobody has references like you really know don't know who you're going to meet. So we were wanting to build a script that uh, people paid for submissions to, or subscriptions to be able to keep track of trades and references to to make sure you know the guy you're trading with is who he says he is. Blah blah blah. But that's to give you an idea of, of my level of crazy. Uh, that that one was that one was one of the most one of the more sane ideas. Uh, but but it's uh, that's that's the brilliance of of the situation whenever you have employees that you. I can't even I can't even imagine, man, what the craziest one is. But uh, the that, that's that's the great part of having having employees that uh, you can bounce ideas off of. I don't know who had the who had the idea for the course. Was it me or was it you? It had to be you. It's probably me. I, I I like that. That's the thing is I, I actually have a teaching degree, and uh, so I'm, I'm attracted to any kind of. Social oh, and I was a college professor, and he was a college professor, so it, it kind of worked out that, that we both wanted to. Now, Eric, Eric's less likely to interact, and he's kind of more on the, on the uh, you know, he's just a more quiet person. 
So he at first he was less excited, but now he now he loves it because he got to he got to deal with people and learn learn some th- great things. Particularly out there, I, I was really proud of Eric with at ASD. You got in there and it was interacting with people and uh, and and did a fantastic job. And yeah, I'm pretty sure everybody who was there got to see, you know, just how smart of a guy he really is. Uh, I'm scrolling back up for a question. I'm not just leaning forward to like look weird. Uh oh. I, I do want to get philosophical for a second. I had some. Let me get uh, this question. Yeah, yeah. Keep your philosophical. Uh, whenever our first hire was, did they just do packing to start? Uh, at first, yes, we, we trained them on packing, prepping items. I wanted them to be better than me at prepping an item. And then we moved to, they can, they, you know, we, within a few weeks, I mean, he was learning to enter items and set up our SKUs and do, and do all the things that we do now. So it doesn't take very long, but make sure that whatever you, the initial thing you hire them on for, which I almost always believe should be packing and shipping because it's a, it's a real time sink for taking away from your business. You know, it's, it's such an easy task to teach somebody. So the, the you know, the most important thing for, for us was getting rid of that because, you know, I, I, I was essentially valuing all my time that I was doing it at 10 or $12 an hour. Which is what I pay our employee. The, uh, but so so yeah. I mean, we we focused on getting rid of that task first, and then uh, the second one was bringing on someone for sourcing, which could make us more profitable. Philosophical time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's basically two points. I'm going to bring them together. And so first point is going to be about uh, how I don't like. I see a lot of this, these things taught specifically with other people or, or a lot of uh, common knowledge about Amazon in general. And there, they, there are these hard rules that you have to follow or, or teaching rules or and things like that. And those are sometimes fine if you're just starting or as a, to, to learn, but eventually you need to start working around the rules. And I'm going I'm to get to that. And then the second point is more about uh, scaling and how, I'm going to use Eric and Dan and the way they grew their business as an example for how they scaled and how it may not necessarily be the same way that you scale or that anyone else scales, and that's okay. Uh, so we'll start. I'll, uh, Eric and Dan were doing retail arbitrage only and, and online arbitrage, and they were doing about a million dollars in sales each year, and just like he was explaining earlier. And they started, and they were working every day. So you have two different types of things. You have a, it's a job when you have to work every day, work real hard, and then if you stopped working, that your business stops producing money. And that's what was happening with them. They had to work hard every day, sourcing and buying and, and reselling, or the money stopped coming in. So they, what they did was they transitioned their business after they had gained enough capital to wholesale opportunities and grew that and grew that. We slow. We actually tried to make retail arbitrage work more. Um, our first year of retail arbitrage, we did $860,000. And at the end of the year, we had a pretty sizable amount of money. So we, we went with long-term old strategy and, uh, and did really, I mean, we did, we did well with it. Uh, that's the point is, you know, all these strategies, you, you, hear, you hear them. If you do them right, they definitely work. We did a, we, we did a lot of long-term hold. But that was us trying to, you know, that was the first evolution of us wanting to change our business. And, and we wanted to be able to do long-term hold to maximize more profit, to be able to maybe get gain some hours back. Ultimately, it didn't work because you're still out there sourcing and sourcing and sourcing to do. So th- what they did is they started to transition their business towards wholesale, where instead of being all over the southeastern part of the country picking up products, now they were all doing it from one place. They're all able to stay here. Uh, in one spot in Corbin, source products, have products come to them and eventually grew their business exponentially from that, hired employees. Now the business pretty much, I mean, you were in ASD the whole week. Like you, you can leave, you and Eric can just leave and the business continues to run with you guys gone. Actually, it was kind of sad when I got back because, well, we've been working, uh, I've mentioned this, we've been working a lot with VAs and our VAs are really picking up steam now. We've transitioned two of them to full time. Uh, doing wholesale stuff. Uh, so Matt was doing a lot of work with VA, but now he's getting so much more information because, he, you know, it's the same concept, though, and he's really team-oriented with our VAs, which is awesome. Uh, but we, he, he has so much information coming at him because 
essentially he's training two versions of himself um, to, to be able to source products. And, and we kind of have it broken up on how they're doing it, but it, one does one thing, one does another one, but he still gets all this information coming in. And whenever uh, uh, we got back, Matt was like, dude, he was like, this is the most insane productive rate week I've ever had. And at first I was like, gosh, I slow you down or something? Like, what do I, what's going on? Am I just chopped liver now? And uh, no, he was like, no, the, the VA, he's like, this VA project is coming together and it's unbelievable. And he was showing me just how, how efficient they were, they were moving back and forth uh, because our VAs work our time now. So it, we just have so much, so much information. We had uh, like on Friday, uh, his, his job mostly right now is, is literally picking up the phone, calling people or sending emails, trying to get accepted. And the emails at this point, a lot of them are just to, we're testing different uh, uh, templates. So we got, on, on Friday we had uh, six, six accounts that we placed new orders with. On Friday alone, uh, he placed new orders with two more brand new accounts today, which is unheard of fast for us. Usually we're in the two to four, two to three a week. And that's because, you know, we, we, we have pretty strict guidelines on our products, but you know, I've explained it before that two to three a week is a lot of sales over the course of a year. And that's, that's how you're able to grow so quickly. But now it's, we're exponentially just jumping that again because of our VAs and how efficiently we run. But this was with us out of the building. So that's what Dan and Eric did to create a business that can function without them and constantly be producing money. So now Dan and Eric can focus on doing other things that build their business. This is like, you know, beyond wholesale, like Matt and Baron and the VAs, me, like we all do so much and keep that business alive. Like he can focus on new outlets, new streams of revenue, new ways that we can grow our business and expand. And so you can do those same things, but you don't have to follow that same structure that Dan and Eric use. There are a lot of ways that you can transition or grow your business and there's not certain rules. You don't have to do everything the way we did or that someone else did. Uh, if you can figure out a way to scale retail arbitrage where it, it can function without you uh, and you can focus on other things, that's awesome. If you can do that, definitely do it. If, or any kind, any kind of different Amazon business, if you can figure out those things, do it. Uh, put that time and effort into it. So you, there, are, there are these hard and fast rules that people uh, – think you need to follow or you need to do no you you can figure it out yourself have faith in yourself we believe in you uh you can do it like people talk about like i hate this i see it all the time i'm going to start the war against the three x rule if you've ever did retail arbitrage i heard people talk about the rule of three x i hate it because certain people like live and die by that and i think it's ridiculous and stupid one of the keys to our one of the the, the keys to how we were able to to grow our ra stuff so quickly is we pretty quickly realized that the 3x rule was kind of poppycock and operated outside of it. But it, whenever we were, you know, all the forums and stuff we were reading at the time, we just swore by it. Oh, it has to be 3x. And it just, but we, we figured out pretty quickly that uh, we, we were leaving so much money on the table. Now, granted, you, uh, oh, I mean, there's, I, I, right. Uh, I, there's definitely people who, who, who do swear by it. It definitely can work. But I, I felt like we were leaving so much money on the table um, that, that we focused our, our we focused instead so much on on return. We focused more on rank and bit of our ability to turn our products over. Uh, so our, our inventory is probably different than most people's because we don't have a lot of like products we're waiting on to get there. Our, our products are generally pretty splashy when they get in and, and gone, and we we run it back. We we focus a lot more on liquidity than we focus on. Uh, profit margin like we we kind of care about ROI yeah you can take those rules and you apply them and understand their concepts and then start figuring out how to work outside of them or beyond them don't don't to put everything into a box or put your, the way you operate into a box like I was seeing too often people are trying to live and die by that 3x rule so they're buying products if they're gonna sell for 3x some they're usually throw slower sellers in general uh, and, and so people would find a product that they would pay ten dollars to make five in the end and would not buy it and I just think that's crazy like you would especially considering how products like that sell so fast or fast turn I, I love that concept 
uh, and, and so people just pigeonhole or take these belief systems and think you have to follow them exactly. No, you can work outside of them. If it seems logical to you and you can understand it and operate it, do it. Uh, we do, do. We do have some long tail goods, but it, it's it's not. I'm not saying. I'm not saying like for what it, for what it's worth. I'm not saying if I if I can make more than three X, I, I will turn it down. I'll buy that too. I, I just don't discriminate against right. items where. I'm I'm getting a thirty percent ROI and I'm doing it a million times a month. Yeah, it's we'll just no, we'll, we'll do anything that works. Like we'll do long tail stuff if it works or if it's good for us. Like well, there's nothing that we just like we tell you to to so deal with manufacturers and avoid wholesalers. But we'll buy from a wholesaler. We'll work with a wholesaler if the money's there. If we can, you know, we'll do anything that works for our business. If we look at it and decide, like, yeah, I'll make money off that. Jimmy, that was. You, you said it, should, it doesn't apply at wholesale. I'm, I'm specifically talking about when we were doing RA. Yeah. We, we, that, was, that was what helped us grow our RA business so fast was we focused on, uh, on quick stuff. And that, that's, that's also what makes wholesale so attractive to us is because we've always kind of had the same model. It's just on steroids now. And it went first, interestingly, the first time I talked to Wayne Mallet, I love, first off, I, I want to say I loved Dwayne. Uh, we, we were talking about just general business philosophy. And he asked, he was talking about, you know, how do we view business? And this is before we really knew each other. Asked about our sales. And he was like, well, that's crazy, man. You guys, are, uh, yeah, we, you know, that's RA sales. And uh, he was, you know, he was blown away. And it's like, yeah, I mean, we just did the same concept. You, you talk about fast turns. It's, that's our business on steroids. Like we, we believe it to the T. Like we believe in really keeping our money, always moving, always moving, always moving. Now, Bob asked an interesting question. Uh, the, the, an interesting question back up about the about the long tail, and I said, "Yeah, we still carry long tail as a passing." We with a lot of our long tail stuff, like a one of our one of the businesses we distribute to, uh, was having a little bit of trouble uh, a couple of weeks ago. Needed us to buy a bunch of stuff, and just gave us a huge amount of inventory, really cheap. So that, that's generally the kind of long tail stuff I'm into nowadays. Uh, now I do long term holds. Uh, we we still would do long term holds maybe. We used to do Lego clearance, like Lego clearance, but it's still super fast turning stuff where I'm just waiting for a bigger number. Uh, but overall, I'm pretty sure that for us, for us, I'm pretty sure long term long term hold was was probably not the best strategy. It was just like I said, we try a lot of stuff, and when we commit to a strategy, we will see it through. So we went through a, uh, uh, we went, we went, you know, we will see it through for better or worse. And one year, one whole year was us stocking up for RA uh, for the long term hold stuff to see how much, how much difference in the bottom line. And it paid its bills. We did great with it, but it still, we had so much time commitment for, for RA. Do I ever get sucked? I'm more likely than, than Eric, and Dylan's actually more likely than me. To get uh to suck suck the RA. Dylan Dylan has a blast with it. Like he came back and he they bought some. I'll get your little item you bought the other day. It was expired. I mean, I will just tell them. I don't have to show. I definitely bought an expired grocery box. I can tell you that. <laughs> I, it was so sick too. I was like, oh yeah, man, five dollars and twenty. Didn't even think to look on the label. Of course, just like little silly things that you do. Uh, but I gave I gave you an example of like a the, here's a concept. Here's a product we bought once. It was an RA product that I don't think a lot of people would buy, okay? Uh, it, it's a product that costs $7, and we sold it, or we ended up netting, we bought 170 units of this RA. It would cost $7, and the, the profit was $1.50. And we, so 170 units. So would you pay $7, 170 units to profit $1.50? Well, we did it, because the sales rank was 18 and toy or something like that. So we bought 170 and then the first day we hit the buy box, we sold, just, just guess how many, I'll wait for it, 170. Uh, so th those are the types of things that we're willing to do. We're willing to spend $7 to only make $1.50. At, at the time when I bought them, I actually went and rounded those up because I was really bored one. Is on a Saturday. My wife was in. Uh, <laughs> my wife was out of town, and I was like, "What am I going to do?" And then uh, I I just went and started doing RA. 
um, just just because I, I I was I'd been working on some really long projects and I was kind of burnt out and I was like oh man I was going to keep doing it and then I was like man RA is kind of relaxing so I just went and did some RA and I actually called some people from the group uh, and, and talked to them about about their business and all kinds of uh, it's, it's just a, probably the weirdest day in a long time where just I probably had ten calls with with random people talking about their business while I was out scanning product and picking up that item. At the time we were making three dollars, so at seven dollars make three dollars, which is still way below the three X rule. But it, you know that's that's the thing is if you're picking up sales ranks where the liquidity is just there, like yeah, I mean if I, it, I it's interesting, I won't move on yet. But if you if you focus on that liquidity, your loss is going to be pretty minimalized. Your your, your gains are going to be pretty pretty standard. Um, and this came up at ASD. I was talking to one of the people from our group, Mark Lynn. Mark, it's awesome meeting you. I don't know if you're in the in the chat tonight, Mark, but it's awesome meeting you. Um, but Mark, we <laughs> interestingly enough, so so we're you know we went through on day one uh, on the items where we knew we liked them. We just went ahead and placed the orders, um, and the items where we wanted to research it. We got a bunch of business cards and contact information, and you know made some buddies or whatever. But uh, on one of the items, Mark said, he's like, I almost bought that on day one. He's like, because uh, it, it sales rank was six to 800 in pets. I think it was closer to six. Not sure. It was really, you know, six to 800. And, you know, you're flipping quarters at that point. But uh, anyway, he was like, yeah, I scanned it on day one, and you were making, yeah, you, it was profitable, and you make, you're making like $4 a unit. Uh, and, and the cost was 375 so it was nuts. I, I mean, I bought it when I looked at it. I've still not even looked at it. I don't care uh, since I've been back. But he was like, I went back on day three, and some some guy had come in with a few units at uh, uh, you know three dollars lower or something. He's like, now you only make a dollar fifty. Like I don't, you know, how do you how do you feel about it? And I was like, at that sales rank, I bought I think about two hundred and forty units, which is you know uh, relatively nothing at that sales rank. Um, I was I'm just not concerned like. If it comes in, and how, you know, he asked about how we're going to price that. When it comes in, my primary pricer will match the lowest price. I will get the buy box. I will, you know, I, or I will, I will share the buy box, and I will sell out of my item. If it's at the cheaper price, fantastic. I probably won't reorder it. It's not profitable enough for my time. If, if I lose 70 cents an item, which probably, I mean, I don't think it'll happen, but if I did, it wouldn't bother me either. I just won't reorder the item. But if it comes in, it, it's back up to the price where I scanned it. Ching, place a much bigger order, and, and really try to really win the game. Yeah, I have a question for you, Dan. This will be a good uh, thought experiment. Would you be willing to go to, to order and sell two bad items if it meant that you would find a good item out of it? God, yes. Three items, three bad items. If you I would them. sell hundreds of the bad items See, to find the good items. Right. Every time. Because, like, if we, it's not about – for for me, it's not about like I said. It's not about uh, it's not about immediate money. I don't care if I'm profitable right this second. Like, this buy doesn't have to be mega profitable for me to feel good about it. It just has to be intriguing and intriguing in that I know I could a get a bigger discount. Intriguing that I know I could develop a, a relationship that gives me a bigger discount, or the item is is fluctuating, but generally fluctuates up. Then I'm more likely to make the purchase. I you know as far as Needing it right then to be profitable, I, I, it's not. Uh, no, we we do have access to uh, to daily payouts. We've not used them in years. We we generally go to. Uh, uh, we I don't think we've actually requested one in about a year and a half, beyond just the standard two weeks. But yeah, I mean, don't. Whenever you're looking at your business, like I said, focus on your goals, not on on on. You know, does the, if you're if you're looking at everything in a microscope, like this has to be prop, this item has to be profitable. You're you're just making your time, you're costing yourself so much time, so much indecision, so much stress, so much worry. Like if you're looking at an item, like ah, it's a good item, it looks good, I'll sell it. If it's good, if it's good again, fantastic. If it's not, I'll cut it and find a better one. And and that's kind of been our philosophy the whole time. Like we we just it, it, and and most of the items end up being good. And it, you know, like I said, if they don't. They, they just get cut and we had a cycle through where we, you know, we lost $210, you know, and I can accept to it. 
$210 to, to, to find the 10 items I'm willing to take a chance on that nobody else will. Uh, that's all the... Um, I'll get back to that one. Reading. Yep, reading. Sorry. Uh, I'll get I'll get to you on that one, Bob. Uh, Andrea said about the back to the daily payouts. I missed the second part of that. Uh, like the model, but the cash flow with low ROI can be challenging. ROI is really not that low. I mean, our ROI is our ROI is around thirty two percent on average. Uh, as long as you're reinvesting as much, but it's as you it's can. coming back. You know, low ROI. I agree with you. Low ROI with Normal with normal sell throughs is pretty bad, but if you look at it, like let's say let's say that I sell uh, most of our products sell a hundred times a month. If my product costs ten dollars, I'm investing a thousand dollars a month into this product, and I'm returning thirteen hundred dollars a month. That is a livable ROI to me. I'm not getting jammed with a long product that, that goes longer than I expected. My, my products are super liquid, and, and that's why we focus. You know. You can't you, you can't run that low R, lower ROI model with, uh, with with slow products. You just can't do it. You know that. But that's 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 the beauty of the deal is when you're focusing on those higher volume products, they're inevitably going to be higher orders because you, you know you need more of them, which in turn gets you discounts. So it's it's kind of a beautiful model you have set up there when when you're you know. I, well, I need to order a thousand units of this, and they're going to give me an awesome deal. Awesome deal at a thousand units. I'll just order my thousand units and feel pretty good about it. And, and that's because my my the, my velocity justifies. You know, you're not looking at uh, you can't think of ROI in terms of I'm selling one item. Look at it through your purchase. Like, did you sell? You know, if you're selling a hundred units, look at the hundred unit R, your, your hundred unit return. Uh, thanks for setting up the deal for ungating. What categories would you recommend getting ungated in? Bob, I love shoes. I love clothing. We have our, we, we trained our, uh, and this was super weird. We trained our uh, VAs to do OA and uh, primarily a lot of that. So like I said, we have two, we've moved two over to full time. Uh, to full-time wholesale, we left one just doing shoes. We left one VA just doing shoes because shoes is so profitable, it's crazy. The 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 sell-through rate's not as, as high as I like, but the, the the margin is the margin is huge, and it's it's a market we're learning about. So it's like it, it, it you know we don't live by just like Dylan said, you know we we really believe in the high model the the super high vol, high velocity terms, but I, th I think the shoes can be super profitable, so we're willing to test it, even though they're, they're not, you know, I'm not going to move 90 units of any one shoe a month. So it's just, I'm pretty sure that's just not going to happen. But uh, I, I, for shoes, I'm, I don't know how, I don't know how aggressive most people are in shoes. Like, I, I've not even really read about it. I just I thought it was interesting on how high the returns were. To give you an example, one of the shoes we bought today, uh, our, our employee Roy was telling me about, he said that they had, uh, he was able to get 17% off on some kind of uh, gift card, and then he did be frugal for some other arbitrary percentage off. The gift card was bought with our percentage off coupon or our percentage off uh, cashback credit card, and it was originally $20 into $80 with a 4K rank and shoes. So uh, it sounds pretty. I mean, it sounds pretty sick. I, I, that was before all the crazy discounts. So I, that's that's the one thing I really love about the. Uh, the shoes. I go back up. If you just asked the question, I am coming down. Should prices go back up after August fifteenth? I've not even really noticed a significant drop in prices. Like. Uh, The as far as as far as I've, I've not really noticed any drops in 
job, so like uh, absurd drops in prices. For us in health and personal care, it seems like prices get were really high in January and then kind of like man, like went back to went back to like reasonable land. And uh, after after January February, but still, I mean, our, our returns are fine. Um, I had an interesting conversation with somebody earlier where uh, he he showed me a couple of his products and we were talking about how we approach them. And uh, I think it's just, it's just different kind of mindset. Like the products were intriguing in that I think one of them had like a 24% ROI. And I said, I would probably buy that, but be working to get my third, working to get to a 35% ROI because I think it's possible. And we do a lot of that. So like our, our items on the front end, they look less profitable, but we grind and grind and grind and get discounts. And that's, that's one of the things I implore you to do is always be, always be looking for more margin. We got, we got actually pretty much the most insane offer I've ever seen on a wholesale list today. It was actually a pretty competitive prices to start out. Um, if we wanted to place a distributor order, we would get an additional 40% off. And the, the distributor order was $10,000 MOQ. So that was, you know, at a, that, that sounds really good, right? So what do we do? Matt did not start it. He was fighting for 50%. He's fighting for 50% to raise future MOQs. So that, that's the kind of attitude I think you have to have is he, he's working to get an additional 10% off already insanity numbers because that's our, uh, uh, you know that that's that's our model is we we don't take anything for uh, for, for just the face value we're constantly working for it. and that's also the part of having having good employees you know I'm more likely to actually have accepted the 40% because the products were already good he is he is legitimately fighting trying to get 50% and and does it all, all the time I mean that's, that's what he does he, he sets up the account and, and hammers away and hammers away and hammers away and they always gave one of our items, uh, didn't he tell you one of our items where it's like a $20 item too? I mean, this is a significant discount. He gave, didn't he have them giving them a $4 discount per item now? Yep. And this is unadvertised discount level. Like, we were already at the max discount level. And he has them give, giving us a $4 discount per unit. And it's an insane item. So. Yeah, you got to fight for those. Uh, and, and, you know, do what you can and say what you can. Like, once you you've been approved and you're negotiating and, and stuff like they're, they'll work with you sometimes. I mean, you know, they, it, you'll be surprised what you can accomplish if you just try, uh, to fight their, down those prices. Got a question here. It's uh, what about a phone script? Ron asks, do we use a, do we have a phone script when we contact a wholesale? Yeah, and that one's so tough because you don't really know what you're going to ask. Yeah. We, I think or it's get a, asked. Yeah. Like, uh, Dan does a lot of the, the phone calls to companies and Matt does a lot of the phone calls to companies and they just know and they've done it a lot now so they, they just know what to say or how to work. But when you're first starting, I think instead of developing a script, it can be really good if you need that help to create some bullets. Just write down some bullets of the things that you know are important that you want to convey and remember to convey and the questions that you want to remember to ask. Uh, so about you know threat like discounts or volume discounts or and what value added that you bring to their company if you're still trying to apply to their com uh, company so if you're like in a pre-approval state where you haven't been applied all the different values that you can provide touch on all the points in bullet form or whatever in your notes there that that you want to convey and if you've already been approved and you're negotiating the price uh, all you know, all the different things that you should be asking or try to negotiate in terms of price, but in terms of volume discounts or specials or seasonal or heck, if you, even if you're to the point where you're asking about closeouts or things like that with companies too. I mean, those are things that you may want to ask about, especially this time of year. Closeouts can be really good heading into quarter four, like we mentioned earlier. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's uh, I realize how flush I am. Maybe I'm running a fever. My stomach has been killing me all day long. But uh, Anyway, back back to that. It was just be looking for the discounts. Like just be just be actively looking for those discounts. Be, be you know you have to be aggressive. You have to kind of throw yourself out there. Don't ask for a discount before you get the account though. Make yeah. sure you're in. Make sure you're in. You want to come across as super easy to work with, and you want to be super easy to work with after they give you an awesome discount. Free shipping or shipping discounts, or if you don't like the shipping, you can schedule your like you know we've taught you can manage that yourself. 
Um, Especially LTL. Kim said do, we. She thinks we've mentioned earlier. Yes, we have, yeah, we have more than one Amazon account. Uh, we we have two. Next question is: Can you get in trouble from a manufacturer if you price higher than MSRP? So it's kind of like the reverse of MAP, right? Like, is there a point where they'll get mad because you're pricing too high? I have never seen that point. Uh, or one one product actually that I showed with you, Dylan, that other day, where they had a they had a max RP. Right. Yeah. But the, the discount was pretty insane. It's a it's a forty dollar item on Amazon, and it sells for, or uh, the wholesale price is fifteen dollars. But their MOQ is eighteen thousand dollars for the one item. Yeah, my, and you can only use or you can only sell currently splitting splitting the buy box by my estimation. What was it? Uh, Wasn't it like uh, I think it was like eighteen hundred units or something, fifteen hundred units. I'm pretty sure you can only sell about nine hundred in a year. So it's like I'm, that's that's a little too. I don't I don't like to go deep into the into the the holding inventory. I like to keep a lot of inventory that sells really fast and, and replenish it. Yeah, 99.9% .9 of companies aren't gonna care how you sell it. They actually enjoy or want their uh, product to be more valuable for that value to be raised because that means eventually they can start charging you more for it. <laughs> so for the most part, they want those prices to go up like that. Joel asked, do we ever ask our rep, reps that we're talking to if they have closeouts, we tell them we want to hear about every single closeout. Yeah. So uh, even reps, we, it's so weird, but even the reps we don't buy from, buy from very often will send us their closeout list because they know we like, uh, particularly now, uh, we have one rep that uh, I, uh, she, it, it's so weird. She, like, I'm sure she, she will come down in the next two weeks because it's, it's, about, it's about when she came down last year and, and we never talked to her and then, she really understood at that time that we wanted closeouts because mm -hmm. toys are so she's a toy rep. Toys are so competitive and, and the, the, for wholesale. And, and big brand toys anyway. Yeah. People buying those closeouts all the time and it's probably just because toys isn't your there's no gating for toys, so it's just popular. For what it's worth, if if we find a closeout that, that we want to Split. We're going to post it in the group. I mean, that's our goal. Um, we haven't found anything that we couldn't handle as much as we wanted of that, that we didn't post yet. But you know, we're we're actively currently looking for closeouts, and that's we'll, we'll chop them up with people from the group if we run across anything. Our, I posted in the group earlier that we had our Q4. We had two major closeout items last year. Both of them ended up being amazing. Uh, one of them was a Matchbox truck, I think, and it was $11 wholesale. At the time we bought it, it was $22, and you made like 3 bucks or something. And by the end of quarter four, it was $26 or $27, and you were making, you were making a real margin at that point. Was Polly Pocket the other? Yeah, Polly Pocket, that one. Oh, my Lord. That, one was, that one's probably one of the better buys we've, we've made as collectively. Uh, but the, the Matchbox truck, I think we bought 800 or 900 units. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, we, don't, we don't buy, uh, John, John, we do not buy, we, we don't buy liquidation uh, for the most part. I, it, it's messy, uh, in my experience. I mean, other people swear by it. And I, you know, that's, that's, the thing is, that's the thing I love about Amazon and business in general. Everybody has different strategies that works for them. We, I, I'm pretty sure I couldn't bring myself to do liquidation, but uh, we, we buy legitimate, when, when we buy closeouts, we buy a legitimate closeout. And it's not a big part of our business, it's just something we like to, to hit in quarter four, particularly. Yeah, that's back to that thing I talked about earlier, about how hard and fast rules, or, or just doing what works for you, or if you're smart, and, and, and just evolve, or use logic, like, we haven't had success with liquidations. We don't do them, and we maybe recommend that people try to avoid them to keep from getting burned, but that doesn't mean that they're bad, and it doesn't mean that people can't be successful doing it. Just All that being you know, said, I made an, um, I created an 888 Watts account last night, so uh, they, they actually claim to have not uh, uh, not shelf pool liquidation that, or, or whatever, so 
So I will give it a shot if it looks good enough and the manifest is there. I, I, I don't have any experience with 888 Watch yet. I literally got an account last night, haven't even, haven't even opened it yet. Uh, do we prefer to ship in items palletized? God, yes, if at all possible. Yeah. It saves so much money. I, we, we will not save items to, to make pallets. Like it, whatever comes in, uh, our, our, the way our workflow is, is if it comes in today, we want it shipped this evening if possible. So if that means we're going to ship in a uh, in parcel form, we'll do that. But if we can combine and get to a pallet or we have multiple pallets show up. And I don't like shipping one pallet. I like shipping two, three, two yeah. to three. Two is kind of the minimum. Three or three plus is kind of where I like to be at. Yeah, I think you save, it's something like on average, you'll save like $40 on the first pallet, like 80, between 80 and 100 on the second pallet. And then the, the savings can really be, can ex expand from there. Like you can save hundreds of dollars a month thousands of dollars a month shipping pallet if you can if you can do it. I mean if you have enough volume to where you can ship pallet, definitely do it. <laughs> Outside of parcel, if you have the volume, you, you will the savings are legitimate. Um then Joel asked, any recommendations on how to do pallet shipment? Pallet shipments are very, very easy to do. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if, they're easy they're easy because we have a dock. Uh, if you don't have a dock, you have to kind of say, I actually don't remember. It, it, I remember it wasn't very hard. Like we, we sent a pallet shipment from our old building a couple times with the Matchbox trucks, actually. Um, and that was, it wasn't very hard. I mean, I don't remember how we got a, a requested a lift gate, but one with a lift gate showed up and we, we put the pallet on the truck. Um, depending on where you live, you might want to get a pallet jack if you're going to be shipping pallet shipments. Some some companies will come off the truck, get the pallet for you. Some won't. It's best to have a pallet jack just in case. Otherwise, they require you to put it on their lift gate. I've heard of that. Um, but but it's it's easy going through and making a pallet. It's uh, 1,500 max weight, 72 inches height. We like to cut ours off at 70 inches to make sure they you know they get a uh, they get a little fussy if you don't uh, follow their follow follow the, the High roll. Um, yeah, absolutely, Tina. Absolutely, post it and post it. I mean, not only in the chat, post it in the group. I mean, I love. Uh, I love. We actually got called from another pallet, or another freight forwarder today. Um, I'll post it in the group later. But he said he would crush any rates we're currently getting. Like, which I find pretty hard to believe. We get some pretty outstanding rates, uh, but I'll I'll let him try. I promise. The uh, so anyway, back to the eight eight lots liquidation. I think that's like a good example of, of of how we just really don't follow rules. Even though I hate I like my first inclination with liquidation because of our experience was was terrible. I saw that it was you know that they advertised non uh, uh, non shelf pool inventory. And I, I'm wanting to see it. If, it. if it works, I'll by all means, I'll tell you guys, like, hey, it worked out great for us. I don't suspect it will, but eh, I'm willing to give it a shot. I don't care. I, that, that's the thing is we experiment with a lot of uh, a, a lot of stuff. And I, I think you have to be open. You know, I'm, I'm not I, – I, I love wholesale. I, I love what wholesale has done to our business. I would not – change anything about our business at all. I, I love the way it's growing. I love the way it's shaping up. But if I found a, a good enough REI, I would be willing to go buy it. I mean, that's it's just the, that's, that's the thing is I don't turn down money. I, I, I focus on wholesale, so I don't really find the REI opportunities that I used to. But that's, that's because I, I know I see, I, I'm able to see my growth. But if you guys can make money, I don't, don't turn it down. I mean, don't don't turn it down on, on principle. Don't turn it down on random rules and you know, like I said, I, the three inch rule it works for a lot of people. We don't we've never really subscribed to it. If I can buy something for ten dollars and uh, sell it for twenty five and bring back or or sell it heck if I can sell it for uh, twenty dollars and bring back fourteen, I am in there all day every day if it, if it sells fast. Like I don't want, I don't want my money. I care more about my money sitting in potential profit than I care about making a profit. I, I like to make a profit. 
and do so quickly. I don't, I don't like to have my have future profits as much. Do you guys shrink wrap everything onto the pallet? Uh, yeah, we, we shrink wrap parts. We don't, we don't cardboard and then wrap. We have cardboarded and then wrapped when it was a stupid glass item we bought. Uh, gosh, I, uh, <laughs> gosh. It's super awesome glass item. I mean, if anybody can, can make it work, geez. Too many breaks. But it, you, your return rate is so high no matter what you do. We, we there's a set of bottles we bought uh, and they just break, they just broke religiously. I think God we're out. Like, yeah, you know that the UPS guys are just they have to just drop kicking them. them. <laughs> like we, we did everything in the world to make these things work and just they have to just physically drop kick them. But it seems like they do it. So they they've beaten me. I will I, I, I always I almost want to say I will never carry glass, but that's not always true. I always get suckered in by something. So so what other kind of questions we got, guys? Like I said, um, while, you, while you guys are thinking and matriculating questions down the pipe, uh, for for us the the difference the difference I really do believe in, in entrepreneur and self employed is the ability to scale your business and make your time more valuable. Like make your time where you're coming up with crazy ideas, you're bouncing crazy ideas off of like like I did with Dylan. Because some of those ideas produce a significant amount of money. And that's that's an important aspect to scaling your business is being able to have that time to not be like, well, I need to go buy this or buy that or buy this or buy that. Like we, you know, we're not tied down by time anymore. We got we we go to the we went to the Scan Power Conference. We went to ASD. We actually stayed uh, Bro Dylan may not even know this. I'm pretty sure we stayed like an extra three days um, between the front end and the back end of ASD. Mostly because we like Vegas. And I, I was very profitable playing poker this time. Eric, I think Eric was down 600 bucks, but I actually ran pretty profitably. But, uh, and, and that's because, you know, and we actually talked to people while we were at, at ASD a lot. And, and, but that's, that's the ability it, it gives you is whenever you have your business operating in you, you get to a level where your business doesn't, just like, like Dylan said earlier, it doesn't die whenever you stop committing time to it. Yeah, well, so let's just do that right now. Let's do a thought experiment. Let's think about hiring. So Daniel mentioned that we were thinking about hiring a shopper for RA since quarter four is so strong and we think we can spend a few days teaching this person how to go out and do RA for us and make us some money. So, so let's just all workshop this together and figure out what's a good way to do this or multiple effective ways to do this, ways that we can do it, or make ways that you can do it. So uh, one, obviously the first thing that comes to mind is you just find someone that you can trust, obviously, and you can give them your credit card after you've taught them how to do this and they just go out and source and drive and scan and then buy the things. Maybe you don't like that idea. Maybe it's, it's or Here's where I usually – all right, first first part of my idea, I would I would want gift cards, right? Uh, and some someone that can do you know like figure that out, figure out the whole gift card buying experience. It's addition for additional discounts, or uh, so so that's that's a great way to do it. So instead of giving them your credit card, you're giving them gift cards to buy with. So, so there we workshop that idea out, or uh, an idea I had about it one time was you hire someone. To, uh, to only source, they don't buy. So they go out and they'll when they find products, they take a screenshot on their phone of the, the, the Seller Central app page for it that shows the returns or, or whatever, and they mark down what the price of the product was, what store they were in, and the aisle that they were in. And then they come back each day and give you that pile of, of SKUs, basically of bolos, for either you to go out and buy, so you know where everything is, you can quickly round it all up, or someone else that you, in your business or whatever, to go around that up. So that's one way to do it. Uh, if you, or alternatively, if you did trust that person to buy, when they found those bubbles, they could screenshot message it to you for your review if, if you wanted that, and say yes or no. Uh, and then they would purchase it. Uh, or there's other ways, you know, or workshop other ways to figure out how to, how to hire that person. Uh, yeah. And ways to manage what they're spending and what's coming back. And, and, and we we had a, we heard a guy once that paid commission, so he would just send them out, I guess unpaid, perhaps, 
with their credit card or gift cards, and then uh, or we would pay them some amount of money and pay them on commission. So if they brought back, uh, you know, three thousand dollars worth of profit on those RA items or whatever, he would pay them X amount of commission. That was an interesting way to do it. I don't think we would ever do it that way, but it, it's a it's a thought experiment. It's something to think about or, or ways to lead you to other better ideas. I don't think I could ever. I can for, for the way I the way I generally approach things is I try to think tank wise. I try to come up with the uh, the constraints, like the the problems I have to commit you know, like to, to making this work for me. Um, one of the problems is obviously well, whenever you have an employee with your credit card, your gift card, it's like. How do you make sure they're honest? So if I were, whenever, whenever we go through this process, the first thing I'm going to think about is how I limit my exposure on those fronts. Um, I would research uh, mileage or research if they drove a company vehicle, making sure that they were insured, like what kind of insurance expectations I'm going to have or, or to add them to my policy. Um, we, we go about it like differently. D Dylan always comes with multiple, multiple plans of attack. I come at it from, I look at, I look at just the problems first and which kind of adds for a really interesting mix. Um, but yeah, so I, like I said, I've, I've always on the problems. I'm pretty sure that paying commission is, is strictly wrong, but I'm not entirely like, I'm pretty sure. I, I think whenever you're paying commission, it has to be based on, it has to be in addition to the, to the purchase price, I don't think you can pay on profits because, you know, realistically, they don't eat losses whenever you have losses. Like, I, you know, if you theoretically, if you're paying 5% more or something like that, you might be able to work or 3% more and you, you just haven't defined so well in your in, in your purchase guidelines. So, but these are things we're ironing out. I mean, as far as uh, for quarter four, and I, I love to talk about it in the group too. Um, that's also a great idea, Diana. Is pay per hour? I thought I thought about that one earlier. Pay per hour with a bonus per item. I'm not sure if you would do it bonus per bonus per ASIN or if you would do it bonus per physical item, because like I, you know, I, I don't operate in normal land. I I, I like to buy. You know, I, I don't restrict myself with. Uh, uh, you know, the item doesn't have to sell for fifteen dollars or more. I want it to, and I, I hope it does. But if somebody can buy an item for a dollar and I can sell it for nine bucks and I clear four dollars off that or five dollars, I'm taking it. I don't care. Yeah, when we when we buy an RA item, we buy all of them. Yeah, everywhere. I mean, that we that's can that's our them. general rule too, and that's probably also an, another level of crazy. Is uh, our whenever we were buying items for RA, our general rule is if it's not good enough to buy all, it's probably just not good enough to buy. So. Like I said, we were really focused on how fast we turned our money, and uh, but we would go really, really deep on inventory too. too. Like we would, you know, Elsa dolls whenever they were popular, and I'm pretty sure we sold thousands. And that's because we would buy all, all, all everywhere we saw, everywhere we saw them, we would just buy them all. Like it didn't matter if they had a hundred, it didn't matter if it looked like the next store had a hundred and was like, oh man, we're getting a lot of inventory. Like once we made the decision, we were buying it, we were buying all. So it, we, I guess you know, wide and deep, wide and deep. I guess we're 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 different too. We we don't we focus on pro, like we focus on the, on the actually making money. We don't. I don't care. I don't, I don't go wide to, to go wide. I don't. I don't believe that's a philosophy for us. Uh, I don't go deep just to buy deep. Like I, I try to. I I let the I let the product dictate how I buy it. It's a, you know I don't think I don't by going wide. I don't think you're any more insulated than. than just choosing a better product yeah. in general. Do you want to share that strategy you used last quarter for with like how long you kept an item before you priced it down to sell uh, that you were explaining? That was Eric. Uh, yeah. I, Eric, did, Eric does all the, yeah. the calculations on that end, but yeah. I'm pretty sure it was the second week of December. This, uh, it, it, I may have had it down to like the second Monday or December or something if the prices weren't where we wanted. Then we started coming down and, and matching and then getting getting in the game, so to speak. Um, Diana says, for someone who loves to shop and drive with a prepaid credit card, give them a list of the hot items with a max price, pay per hour, the bonus per item. Yeah, I mean, I love that one. I, I, 
I, like I said, I, I couldn't figure out if the bonus per item works for us, but I, I would definitely find a way to fit bonuses in there, if, even if it was a heavier bonus on the ASIN. Like if they found an ASIN to add to my list, uh, maybe maybe give them eight bucks or five bucks or, or whatever it takes. I, I don't, uh, you know, as long as as long as it works out at the end, I don't care. And I, you know, that's the thing is I'll do the math when they got home and see if it worked. And I, I would probably do trial. We would try, Eric Eric makes me do trial runs with everything, <laughs> so. I'm sure that if I came up with a pay structure like that, I would probably, we would probably have to do it eight or ten times before he was comfortable doing it. What do you think? Probably. <laughs> Eric's a lot more nitty than I am. Right. Do you use master prep sheet or some kind to? I don't even, I don't even know what a master prep sheet means. That the prepping will always be done the same way. Oh yes. Oh, a master prep sheet. Do we have a prep guide? Yes. Let me see if I can find one. Excellent. We'll also post it in the group. Talk, talk. See, we're all helping each other. With, I, I like the little conversation about the work and how we, the thought process that we go through when trying to do something. So, like in this case, we were doing it with the hiring the RA person, the RA employee. So, I, I really enjoyed that little conversation that we just had. And that's just typically how you do it. It also shows the power of mastermind, so we're getting good ideas. Everyone's hearing us thinking that we may be giving good ideas. So, uh, just just love interacting or sharing all these thoughts with people. Uh, another thing, oh yeah, I want to mention this. I don't. You pro, it's probably common sense. You likely all know. So, if you're going to be doing RA in quarter four, um, if you can find or have two or three or four dedicated people that you can identify and form a small bolo group with them. So if you're not going to be shopping in the same areas, right? So if you're from Georgia and you're going to be sourcing around Georgia areas, so then you have someone that you know from Kansas City, from a masterminder group that you're in, that uh, will be doing RA, someone from California or whatever, and you can share bolos with those people to increase the amount of products that you could know and find. We just, we've done, we used to do that when we did RA, had people that we just shared those those products with uh, to increase so that everybody wins to increase the number because it's you keep it a small group obviously so it doesn't ruin the price on any of the products and you can just uh, it's like sourcing 4x being able to do that Dan has returned with yeah I remember he said he transferred it online. So I thought they cut all kind of Oh yeah, he just uses it on the on Google Drive. We can post it though. But I, I can get him to print me one off, and then I can post this as a PDF tomorrow in the group. You got an excellent idea. I don't even know what you do. I told him how uh, I mentioned that it would. It's really smart to do the small masterminds to share bolos with people for RA, especially quarter four. So yeah, we will. Uh, if we are. Uh, I suspect that we will do some level of RA. I don't think it'll be me very much. I don't think it'll be Eric very much. My goal is to have a couple of employees doing RA, and we were willing to. We're, I mean, we're willing to mastermind with people for uh, a small group for for bolos and what have you. So, if that tells you anything, I fully believe in it. Um, I think I think you guys should. I think everybody in general should be. Uh, and, and some level of mastermind. I think the I think the focus of a mastermind beyond bolos, I think it's particularly powerful with bolos. Um, it's particularly powerful when the other person is good at something that you're not good at. We're good at toys, right? So we would be a great resource for someone for toys. And if you're good at grocery, obviously we want to be sharing with you. We want to. If you're bad at toys and good at grocery, we're we're giving you good toys. You're giving us good groceries. So it really expanded our horizons. Obviously, those are the types of things or aspects that you want to be looking at too. If someone is good at certain products or certain categories, but masterminding is beyond beyond just beyond just bolos. Masterminding is one of the most important aspects to your business. You're going to get so many ideas that uh, that, that just grow your business, and it's not. I, I I can't remember how I was talking to, but we were talking about the, just the power of just the power of the master a power of the mastermind in general, and it was from the perspective of. I don't, I, if we're sharing, I don't care about your skew. I don't care about the item so much as I care about, I more, I care more about the why 
And when people explain to me the why, uh, I feel like I'm going to, I'm going to like if I, you know someone explains to me why something works, I can take one nugget away from that and make a pile of money with it. And it's because I trust our ability to apply just the the, the know-how rather than the item. Yeah, more than just things. So like that's a good point. So when we see a RA Bolo or a wholesale product that's great, we're not just like, oh, that's awesome. We, we want to get that. Or we think, oh, how did you find that? Or how did you figure that out? That's what we want to know is the information that comes with it. Not We're just not happy or like. And we're know, not trying to mind you guys for information. No, no. It's just in general, like whenever we were talk, like whenever we talk with internally about uh, one of our guys gets gets an idea, I care more. I don't care about the item he gets to. I care about why, yeah, like how he got there, what got in there, uh, what you know, what what brought on that line of thinking, and it's it's not it's it's so I can replicate it. And I, I try that. That's another thing is if you find a model and, and you're scaling, replicate it. If you find something that works, replicate it a million times. Like do it over and over and over and over. Or find a machine or vehicle. Vehicle. Vehicles definitely can work, but machines are terrible work. But find a vehicle to replicate that. Find something that lets you do it faster. Oh, that reminds me that story. It's a perfect story to tell. Uh, what Eric posted, this was a few weeks back. Eric posted in the FBA wholesale community group uh, looking for a way to make those labels. Oh man, that was a disaster, wasn't it? That's a perfect example. I know. Uh, uh, Eric, he was trying to figure out. I, I don't remember specifically what he needed to be print on that. He wanted label. to. He was looking for a way to print ASIN labels, uh, and date labels on the same label, like so. It's yeah, yeah, with, with yeah, expiration Lord, dates yeah. and and others, and I think even maybe even add other things to it. And he wanted to automate that process, and so he asked publicly in the group if there was a program or a software or a service that would do that for you. Because that's where we are in our business is that uh, rather than spend the time doing it ourselves, it's, it makes more sense fiscally and in terms of our time to get it automated, even if we have to pay for it. And one of the replies that someone mentioned was just like, ah, just do it yourself or just fi you know, like figure it out yourself or whatever. Uh, it, it actually was figure it out yourself, bozo. Yeah, and and, and that's like, but that's the see, that's the that's the mindset, I believe, that is completely opposite to us, and it's the reason that we have been successful is because we don't have that mindset. We have this: I don't care to spend a little bit of money to figure out how to save myself all that time, right? Like, uh, you know, and then other people were uh, other people posted, well, you know, if you found a service that would cost money. Makes sense. I mean, I agree with you, but the uh, I'm at, at this point. I'm looking to do it. I, you know, if I had to pay fifty dollars a month, I'm good. I send in. Hey, what is eight hundred items a day? Nine hundred items a day? Yes. Yeah, think how many stickers you save, and think about how much time it saves. Barren. So I mean, it, 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 we, we, we can make it, we can make up that cost and volume with just the convenience. Yeah. But yeah, it was interesting because he got he's the a lot of the responses were bad and. One guy legitimately said, "Do it yourself, bozo." And I was like, "What? Like, how's this not? Uh, you know, I, I just can't get over the mentality of some people not wanting to to share something so simple." Oh, we actually booted him from the group. I mean, anybody who calls somebody a bozo for no reason or just derogatory, just instant day. Yeah, and that's that's the different mindsets there that you just need to be aware of. Like, don't don't fall into these little holes or. Don't pigeonhole it yourself. It's, uh, yeah, it's uh, it, you know, but that's that's part of the uh, uh, you know that's part of, that's part of masterminding, part of scaling is is coming up with process to be more efficient. We thought that might be more efficient. We were wanting to know about it. We were obviously going to share it with the world. I mean, we wanted to be posted publicly so everybody would know about it. Um, didn't get an answer, but we are still looking. If any of you guys know, we will. Uh, we'd love to know. Oh, I did want to ask a question. Uh, I know uh, the, the sourcing list that we sent out, did, uh, did did anyone have a chance to go through that yet? Did, did anyone, anyone want to give some feedback, some quick feedback, or talk about that sourcing list uh, that we, we posted, the health and personal care one? So, yeah. 
done a few items. We found, um, we did the beauty version of that list and we found 90 items that we should contact manufacturers about, 90 different companies. Yeah. And that was that, now that was through uh, Prime and non Prime. So, uh, you know, that's, that's one that we, we don't generally stay away for, uh, Stay away from supplements. We we embrace them. Uh, our, we got good insurance. Oops. Yeah, Sean started backwards on it. He started from the back and started working his way forward. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, that's different than what everybody else going through would. Wouldn't do probably as well. But yeah, those uh, those lists are. Just wondering if everyone like those lists, like to see more of them, or if they were useful to everyone. So it was a neat little thing we got to come across. Um, we also found a lot. Yeah, I mean, there there were definitely. I mean, that was the, that was from one year ago. So those those were the top five hundred items that Amazon did carry from a year ago. Uh, but yeah, it's a. With, with with those lists, the leaf sourcing off of them is really good too. Yeah, and that's that's where we're at now. Yeah, so it's not just ninety. If you find ninety items, it's not really just ninety items. That's ninety leaf source spots, right? Like you, you find all these. It, that's it's really powerful. Just all those places that you can start leaf sourcing from too. It could, well, that used to be a question that would come up like, where do I start leaf sourcing? Well, there you go. That list it can give you a ton of health and personal care leads. For, for leaf sourcing, great products or, or just good random things. There's a lot of random things on those on those lists. Watching Dylan's video for the third time. Oh no. Watching my video for the third time, you've got to be tired of hearing my voice, right? What video? The website video. She said, Just, I, I can't stand my nasally voice here. Oh, working on the website tonight? Yeah. Oh, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll get there. That's a, I'm pretty sure that's the thing with, with Wix, is once you do it once, like you'll just be 10 times faster the next time. Yeah, you'll get, you'll get better. It's, um, that was also a source, and I guess before we, before we close her down, uh, that was also one of the sources for interesting conversation at ASD, and one of the most important one of the most important co conversations I had with several people. And uh, you know, when whenever you get, you don't realize how important the 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 work is, uh, like the work up front on on building websites like that is, and it, it so it seems so so tedious, so annoying, so potentially unfruitful while you're doing it. It's just, you know, it, it can be actual miserable. And I understand that. And we outsourced ours to Dylan originally because we realized that uh, it was very hard. But, uh, yeah, so Sean got turned down by a pet manufacturer because the site wasn't pets. But whenever you whenever you turn that focus to, to your website, you're building. I mean, you're you're actually building a you're, you're building a commodity that you can use and advertise, and that's that's a vehicle. That, that's a professional vehicle that advertises your company and your professionalism. There's a million sellers on Amazon. There are far less sellers who take the time to build a website. And a lot of the time, to be quite honest with you, I'm pretty convinced that is what the manufacturers were looking for: is people who care about their brand enough to build their own website and stuff like that. You know, it, it just shows a, a level of separation. Yeah, there's a, and, and that's another one of those things that if it becomes a source of frustration for you or it takes, it takes you too long, you think your time can be better spent somewhere else, definitely look into outsourcing or figure out ways. Somebody posted in Scan Power, I haven't vetted this guy, I look if it's work really, or, or no, if it's a service that's worth using. So I'm not endorsing it, but these are the things that you see. So there was a guy that posted in Scan Power yesterday or the day before that uh, was talking about doing setting up those uh, web stores for people. And I don't really remember what he charged. I think it was like $175 design fee. And then there was some sort of hosting, monthly hosting fee. The monthly hosting fee might have been too high. I don't remember what it was. But 
but those those opportunities exist or those are the people that you can look in so and uh most of most of ours are pretty simple too sean yeah and, and you can be creative too so like uh the only, the only made one i actually thought was uh, i was going to say terrible i would not say terrible because it was creative and interesting yeah, you can be great. So, like Sean says, he only has ten products that he can list, right? Or t ten products that he can put up there. So, be creative. Figure out a way to make a, a website that can only list ten products. Could be neat or interesting, or still make sense, or still have a story to convey, or still have a, a, a point of value. You could make it to where for a, a, a short period of time, you know, you can always change the website when you pick up more products. But you can make the, the website called the Perfect Ten or something, where you. The, the website is a general selling website and it just rotates 10 awesome, amazing products or whatever. You just make that part of the whole spin for the website. Uh, or it's about, uh, it's top, you know, something top 10.com or, or whatever. There's always different things that you can come up with or think of that no matter what is holding you back, uh, you can conform to it and work around it instead of trying to square peg round hole type stuff. You know, you can always come up with random stuff. I have a great imagination, huh? Yeah. But it, 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 and you can just ask me, like when you have anyone, any of you have problems or, or have hit a barrier, you need something creative, ask me. I, I, I typically come up with this random crap pretty easily. So like uh, we made a website, I made a toy website that Daniel was talking about that he doesn't, neither one of us really like it, but it was a, I gave it the old college try. It was a random idea. So we're calling it the toy chest, right? It's just a, a 50 products. It's a random conglomeration of random toy products that are for sale. Completely unorganized. Completely unorganized. And that's like the point. A toy chest. That's the point of the website. It's like a toy chest that you just go there and there's 50 random products for you to scroll through. And that is constantly, that will be constantly changing because that draws people back, right? That's the selling point to these companies. It's like a, that people come and check those 50 toys and maybe find neat ones and then it changes. And so they have to come back to the website to see the next set of interesting toys. And we put rare toys up on the site, stuff that you don't find every day or stuff. That's just one of us. And uh, that, that's the idea behind the website anyway, that, that draws the, 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 you can tell that story to these manufacturers and draw them in and it feels legitimate that way. The, uh, and, and this goes back to, what Sean said, you know, you got turned down by a pet company because your your company, your uh, website wasn't pet specific. Originally, our website wasn't anything specific. It had three main categories, and it ended up with like five. It ended up with like five, but we also thought that it would be more beneficial to uh, to be able to focus and. and I don't know. Beneficial. It's not benefit. It's, it's more reasonable to be able to apply for an account as this website and that sells only those types of goods. So our most recent iteration was the anchor site plus five or six sites. Our anchor site is simply a company information site. If you, if you go to etails.com, that's a good example. That's a great example of an anchor site. Uh, is what's another one? Uh, E Revolution Ventures. E Revolution Ventures is a good. It is yeah. it is our good anchor sites. Yeah, those are like main site that has all the other subsidiary niche sites that that is the the parent of the mothership for. And that's and I think that's right now that's the best model to choose. But you, you may not be able to afford that, or you can't do that. And that's not to say that you, that's just what you work toward work right, toward down the road. Is, we started because it was you know obviously websites are expensive or. That, and we, we were just starting out, so we were testing things. We started out with a broad site, general category site, and that's great to do, and it's great to start with, and eventually you evolve beyond it, eventually. It's definitely fine to start there. That's uh, But, that, that, you know, this is essentially part of scaling right here. Yeah. Too, is we, we did start with the, the same sites you guys are being suggested to start with. Those were our first sites, and they did get us off the ground. We did get products. We did start to sell products. We did start to make Pretty pretty significant amount of money. Yeah, we had one site for a whole year. It was just one website for an entire year. Not until very recently did we do multiple websites. And then we had the we, we started. This was one of our crazy ideas where we came in and we were bouncing all kinds of ideas back and forth about an explosion of sites, and we wanted a a lot of them. But then we 
we were, went back to E-Tails, looked at E-Tails, and they, they, we loved the way that they tied them together with their, we call it the anchor site. I don't know. It probably has a more correct term, but I like anchor site because I think it sounds cool. So we, we, we really like the way they did that. And then I, I feel like, they, I feel like using those niche sites, you can, you, you know, like, like John said, you can get so much more uh, action uh, from, from distributors or manufacturers. But just start with one side, start with what works. Like don't overcomplicate it. Start with what works, get moving. The most important thing in, in any business is taking action and doing it again and again and again. If somebody tells you no, call another person. If somebody, you know, if that person tells you no, call 10 more. Like that's, that's what our business is built on. You, it, it's the hardest thing to do is, is the hardest thing to do is be passionate. Uh, just be passionate. Be passionate about your business. Be passionate about your about your employees. Be passionate about your team. Be passionate about your potential. Be passionate about your growth, and, and it, it bleeds through. Like everything you do will be successful in that, in that regard. Just be passionate. Like that's you know. And you've got us too. We're in your corner here. You always have us to ask questions and, and get help. You know, the Facebook group is like I've been saying. It's for eternity or whatever. So. Yeah. Is that it? For life and in infinity to infinity and beyond. So anytime you need help or, or whatever comes your way, uh, we can definitely give our input or thoughts or assistance for sure. But, all right. We want to take one or two more before we go? Yeah, what else? All right. One or two more questions, Bring guys. On. Bring us something awesome. What else you got? Give us something tough. So I want you to do and squirm. You can, you can squirm me at first. An uh, interesting thing. About five minutes ago, you got us. Probably, I don't know if you heard it. If you did, it was probably funny. I noticed how shiny my head is in the camera, and I told Dylan, and he giggled. I was like, gosh, my head is so shiny. Jeez. Uh, no. All right. We're happy to help, guys. I do need the lighting kit. Okay, we'll see. It's Monday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we also have a bad bulb in here. Yeah, our bulb, our bulb keeps going out. We got to talk to him. Going. Yeah, need to get our maintenance guy. Nope. <laughs> just stop doing it on webcast. <laughs> <laughs> see, before he just had no concept. He had no idea that he was doing it. It's so yep. used, so used to it, right here. Wasn't him. thinking about it. Let's see. I will, I will. I will. Though I've actually, I've actually made a. Uh, oh, I thought I, th I thought I should wear a hat. I, don't, I, don't, I can't pull off the wig. It's making me too weird. Uh, a toupee. I would love to. a toupee. A, a wig toupee. I would love uh, to. I'm ball guys for life. But uh, yeah, I just uh, just didn't do it. In the, won't do it in the webcast anymore. But I've made a huge change in my diet. So like. Uh, I will. I will let get tobacco go next. That's that's my next. Uh... No, no. I mean, I'll, I'll have no problems. It's just now. Now I'm now I'm super focused on that. I think that's the next evolution for me is is just getting getting healthy so I can even I have more energy. I have a lot of energy anyway, but I, I can only imagine what I have. I weigh fifty percent of my current mass. Jimmy asks, when you first started, how many hours did you do lead sourcing daily, and how many companies did you have on your list before you started emailing them? Uh, well, we were – at the time, we didn't really lead – like, when we very first started, we kind of just bounced around and looked at products, and, like, it got more efficient and more efficient and more efficient. So, like, lead sourcing, true, like, what we do now, lead sourcing, we probably wasn't doing that for the first three months, maybe. So, it, the, really, the key for that is to spend as much time leaf sourcing as possible. We were sourcing. We were sourcing like collectively probably fourteen hours a day, though. <laughs> so it was just in a much more awful manner. So uh, yeah, you can, you can binge leaf source. You can leaf source randomly whenever you have downtime. But I think if I were to set like an arbitrary number, I would say like. I would want about 20-ish companies maybe before I started contacting them, and I would try to contact those companies all at once. I would try to do that in one big shot 
I, Matt said he had contacted what, 66 companies? 66 last week. 66 um, last week. That he was said he had 190 more on his list. Yeah. To give you an idea of how many, I mean, this gives you guys the idea of how many companies we contact, try to get accounts with, get turned down, go back to, get turned down, go back to. Yeah, so like if you source that, that health and personal care list, right, you'll, you'll find maybe 30 or 40 companies off of it. You'll leave source those lists, spend a week doing that. You find another 30 or 40. So then you have 80, right? Like you have 80 companies to contact, and then you spend a day or two just shooting those email templates out here and back, contact them. And maybe out of that 80, maybe you uh, you get approved for 30, right? I'm just giving you random arbitrary numbers, but maybe you get approved for 30, and maybe 12 of them have prices that where you actually make money and you want to order. It's less than that. But, right, but, it, like, but, but hey, like, that's, that's the, what it takes. Like, and then, then you have all these profitable products that you, you have more, you're approved for more accounts than you have money to buy from at that point, right? And so it's awesome. Uh, you just have to put in that, that, that big blast of effort, find those companies, contact them, and understand that you're going to get turned down a lot. There's going to be unprofitable products a lot. There's going to be opportunities for you to where you maybe can't don't have enough money to reach the discount threshold, and that's when you start working on finding people that uh, to do group buys with you and stuff. So that you're always always trying to, to to make this work. Because once you start getting the ball rolling, once everything starts flowing, it really starts flowing for you. It's like trying to put your mouth on a on a fire hydrant. Seriously, whenever you really get going. Yeah, yeah. Like eventually, I feel like I'm gonna sneeze. You keep growing. That money keeps rolling in. Like, and, and, you know, you just find a couple of really good products. Like, it, it, you just get to the point where you just can't spend enough money. Sean said he has been lease sourcing four to five days a week. He emails three or four companies a day and has reached out to about 15 companies since Friday. That is awesome, man. Has, has any of the companies contacted you back? If so, how did it, how did it do for you? Uh, Sandy and Annie says... Didn't see the list. Yes, it is in the files of the Facebook group. Um, for future reference, cut that out. Uh, uh, make sure to get, copy that list if you don't have it. At some point, and we'll, we'll post this whenever it gets closer to time. Um, we're not, that's not going to be a uh, given to the, the next course we run. So that, that's, that one's actually just for you guys. Uh, I have three. Both of our wives are calling us. <laughs> I have three K to go through. How do you propose a pack of this monster? Three thousand with three thousand dollars, I find an awesome pro. I, I just find awesome products and buy and buy what I can. I mean, like I said, I don't care about going deep versus wide. Like I'm not going to buy three of this, two of that, five of this. I'm going to find products, and I'm going to if they fit my if they fit my guidelines. Uh, then I'm, I'm going to spend that money and, and just do it again. He said 3,000 manufacturers. I mean, he's got 3,000 companies that he's sourced out. Yeah. That's great news. I, I just do as many as said that I could do. Uh, really, I would just try to I'd contact as many as I could contact and reasonably keep up with. But eventually, I mean, with that many companies, that, that's more companies than you have money to spend. So you just try to... I mean, just keep, keep. I'll take a challenge. I mean, that's, that's the thing is that's a good problem. That's a good to have. problem. Uh, yeah, you know, Sean good. says no super accounts. They don't have to be super, Sean. They, they, for us, a lot of ours are. You, you, you look at it like a baseball game. A lot of ours are singles, and I'll take singles all day long. And then, uh, but uh, I just we we put ourselves out there so much that we get home runs too. It's like, you know, that, that's the thing is our low, our low ROI is like where we like I said we. 15 to 20 percent is where the last point at which I will they, they get my interest. If it's lower than that, like there's no interest or whatsoever, but they'll get my interest there, and I try to get my margin up to 30, 35 percent. We also have items that we're where we have ROIs 150, 150 percent. It's just uh, I I don't turn it down. I, I look for I look for the singles. I look for the home runs because I feel like once I have these accounts going, I'm, I'm going to make X dollars per month for for some, some amount of time. Uh, 3,000 manufacturers contact, how about that? Fantastic. Big old list. 
I mean, that's I'm pretty sure that's more manufacturers than we contacted in the past year. Or it's close. I mean, it's probably really close to that. Maybe less. I don't know. What'd you say, Bill? I have no idea. No I, clue. I can't put it. But that's a lot, and that's awesome. So I would. I mean, that sounds like that sounds like a fantastic opportunity. Uh, what a, a toy company said they don't have wholesale accounts. Huh. That's the strangest one. That one's hard to come back from. We don't sell our product. Uh, it's like, all right. What do you do? Uh, uh, but uh, that's yeah, a retail yeah, company. Yeah. Is that <laughs> or something? <laughs> Jesus. Uh, uh, I mean, if you you that that's the thing is we we focus on products that sell ninety times a month. If I find a product that sells fifty times a month, and it's it's got a good margin, still I will consider. I'll still consider it. That's the that's the thing is we set the rules to we set the rules as gu rules for us are guidelines. I don't I don't stay inside the line. I curve weave. Yeah, and if I can only uh, afford to order the product where I have to order like a small amount, order every two weeks, I'll order every two weeks because <laughs> that's just what I ask. That's, that, that's what has to be done. I'll do it that way. I'll do it every drop I get from Amazon if I have to. So, I mean, it, look at it from that perspective, too. It doesn't have to be. The, the rules are guidelines, but they are in place for a reason. They, the, the more liquid you are, the safer your money is because it's going to be returned to you quickly. Uh, so so you don't, you're, not, you're not waiting, waiting, waiting for a big, you know, a big loss, a big gain. Like, it's you just... It keeps the risk. It keeps the risk pretty minimized. There's no way to get it completely out, but it makes it much le much less likely to hurt. All right. Anyway, it was fantastic. As always, I love talking to you guys. You guys are awesome. And uh, for, for the one for the people I met in Vegas, I, you know, I, like I said, awesome meeting you, Sean. I know you're on here, but the guys and the gals who watch it tomorrow, it was awesome meeting you guys. You guys are fantastic. And uh, we, uh, we we look forward to keep, keeping it up in the Facebook group. Everybody just needs to just, just keep hammering away. You'll get there. All right. See you all.